Oh, hello, and welcome to my salon here. My name is Francis James Barrard, uh, nicknamed Bumbly. I got that from my friends since I kind of bumble around a bit. Uh, well, I was born at 96 Gloucester Place, London, on the 16th of June in 1856. I commenced study of art at the age of 18, going to Heatherley's School of Art, and then to the Royal Academy School, where I received the silver medal for drawing from life. After attending the Academy at Antwerp, eventually I returned here to England, going to Liverpool and then to London, where I worked continually until my illness. I was a frequent exhibitor at the Royal Academy as well as the Institute of Painters in oil colors and other important exhibitions. It was written. Let me see if I can find it. It was written. Yes, there it is. Ah, yes, oh. wrong side, huh. here we are, yes, it was written that his paintings displayed great accuracy of detail as well as thorough knowledge of color values and were delightful in their charm and simplicity. One of my earlier works, An Encore to Many, was published by the Liverpool Corporation and was displayed in the Walker Gallery. Let me show you my painting. Over here. Encore to many. It's one of my favorite pieces, you see. There was a circus in town at the time, and I sketched it out several days later, and then decided to paint it. You see this young lad, acrobatic. He went out, of course, for an encore, hence an encore to many. He came backstage, he was totally exhausted, and he was assisted by his fellow troop members to recover. He was getting some water there, it looks like. Hence an encore to many. One of my favorites. It was, however, by the painting of his master's voice that I achieved worldwide fame. Yes. A critic of the day wrote about it, and here it is. Both subject and title seem to have been inspired. Never was a title so apt or a painting so vivid to portray of its title. Well, I, I did write a sworn statement of the following. I said the painting is entirely my own original work. It was originally designed and painted by me sometime prior to the year of 1899. But in its original form, the dog was listening to a phonograph, which is a cylinder machine, a, a Edison Bell Tainter type cylinder machine. 
On February 11, 1899, I filed an application for a memorandum of assignment of copyright of dog looking at and listening to a phonograph, which is a cylinder machine. Difficult to say how the idea came to me beyond the fact that it suddenly occurred to me that to have my dog listening to the phonograph with an intelligent and rather puzzled expression and call it his master's voice would make an excellent subject. Well, we had a phonograph here and I, I often noticed how puzzled Nipper was trying to make out where the voice was coming from. It was one of my happiest thoughts I ever had. Well, you see, I have a phonograph here in the studio, and I, I play it to relax my subjects while they're getting their portraits painted. You see, it, it sets them at ease. It's very important for an artist to paint their subject matter while they're sitting still. <laughs> Let me play you a piece of music. It's one of my favorites. It's of Enrico Caruso. O solo mio, or my sunshine. I have this wonderful monarch. Of course, it's a Victor talking machine. I have a sock that I put in the horn to muffle the sound. It works every time. <laughs> it puts the tone down. It's the volume reducer. Yes. such music to the ears. You see, it even puts me at ease.
bravo, bravo. Mr. Caruso, he gives me so much pleasure. I first exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1881 of a portrait of my Uncle George Rose. I also exhibited at Burlington House until about 1902. Wow. However, in 1903, my work was rejected by the President and Council, and my most famous work that I had offered for exhibition was refused by the Royal Academy. In an article in one of the art magazines of the time, they wrote, I called it his master's voice and showed it to several publishers as I, I thought there would be a demand for it in reproduction. These gentlemen, however, were not of the same opinion. Well, one well-known man objected on the score that no one would know what the dog was doing, a Mr. Edison. Another on the score that no one would know what the dog was doing. However, he offered me five pounds for it, but I was not tempted. Meanwhile, I was thinking of improvements. I was not satisfied with the trumpet I had painted. It was black and ugly. I wanted something more pictorial. But one day, a friend of mine suggested I should call on the Graham O Phone Company and ask them to lend me a brass horn to paint. So, armed with a small photograph of my oil painting, I paid them a visit at their offices, which were then in Maiden Lane. To the gentleman there, I explained what I required and showed him the photograph. He asked me at once if he might show it to the manager, Mr. Barry Owen. I agreed. Mr. Owen shortly came out and asked me if the picture was for sale and whether I could introduce a machine of their make, a, a gramophone, instead of the one in the picture, you see. Well, I replied that it was for sale and I could make the alterations if they would let me have an instrument to paint from. Well, I wrote them a letter after a week had passed, asking if they were still interested in the painting. Well, I waited and waited. Well, they finally wrote back after about two weeks. Well, the change was made, and the picture was bought from me. I was paid a hundred sterling pounds. Yes, 50 pounds for the painting and 50 pounds for my artistic rights. It was a Mr. Berliner who purchased the rights, and so when Mr. Eldridge Johnson became a partner, you know, in that consolidated partnership, he too had ownership rights of his master's voice. Well, Mr. Johnson recognized the value of his master's voice picture. He acquired the rights to it from the English company and featured it in his American advertising, you see. 
uh, it was encouraged by his general manager, a uh, Mr. Leon Douglas. Smart thinking. Well, I suggested that that they not add any lettering to the piece as, well, the image spoke for itself. His master's voice. Nippa belonged to my brother Mark, who was a scenic artist at Bristol. He did that for many years. Oh, Nippa never left my brother's heels. When Mark took his call for a transformation scene on the stage, you see, scenic design for the canvas backdrops of the theater, that's, that's what he did. All of our family were artists. Well, Nipper, Nipper always followed him on the stage. Well, when my brother died, well, Nipper attached himself to me. I had him for many years. Well, he's now in dog heaven. Well, Nipper was a splendid subject to play practical jokes on. <laughs> I had cut out a cat image of cardboard and painted it black, you see. Oh, I would sit it in his dog bed. He always, he always rushed in thinking it was real. Oh, he was taken in over and over again. Oh, he was, again and again, he loved that tease he did. Pardon me. Oh, Nippa. Nipper was originally a little stray puppy my brother took in off the streets of Bristol. Ah, uh, one day on his way back from the theater, he was raised in Liverpool. Liverpool, England, he was a mixed terrier. Nipper died in 1895 and was buried under a mulberry tree in Kingston upon the Thames, England. And to think Nipper would become world famous. <laughs> but the managing director of the gramophone company told a friend of mine that it might interest me to know that out of their head offices and factories at Hayes in Middlesex, they have frequent fire drills, you know, practices. Should an actual fire take place, the firemen have instructions. They have instructions. Oh, do they have instructions? <laughs> that the first thing to be saved is guess what? That's right, the original picture of his master's voice, which hangs in the boardroom. He also stated that the first to the last, over a million pounds had been spent in reproducing it. Well, I myself was commissioned 12 copies. You see, that's what I'm doing now. I'm making a copy of Nipper, listening to... Yes. Mm -hmm. If Nipper only knew that he would... He would wag his tail so proudly that he was being copied 12 times. Neither he nor I had any idea how the painting and image of his master's voice would be handed down to posterity. Ah, oh, beautiful. Well, I, 
I thank you for coming into my studio today. It's been quite a great pleasure talking about Nippa. Thank you. <laughs>